Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 31. In this lecture, we'll discuss power. This topic is covered in Chapter 8 of our textbook by Surway and Gillette. We've been talking about work quite a bit over the last few lectures. We've been talking about how forces can influence objects by moving them, by displacing them, and this influence is referred to as work. And by now we know how to calculate the work performed by various forces. One thing we haven't been talking about though is how quickly that work is performed. So if you push a box across the floor of a warehouse from point A to point B, then you've performed some work. But often what we're interested in is how quickly you performed that work. Did you push the box from one end of the warehouse to the other end of the warehouse in 10 seconds? Or did you do that work in 10 minutes? Clearly there is a difference uh, in how quickly the work is performed. And to quantify that concept, we need to introduce the idea of power. More precisely, the rate at which work is performed is referred to as power. Average power is a little easier to understand. If you perform work W in time delta T, then the average power is work divided by delta T. So if you, uh, for example, perform 100 joules of work and you do it in, let's say, 10 seconds, then your power output, or the power you have generated, is simply 10 joules per second. On the other hand, if you do the same amount of work, let's say 100 joules, in only one second, then your power output will be 100 joules per second. That tells us that you've done the same work, but you've done it much more quickly with greater speed. The rate at which the work was performed was greater. Now, often we're not interested in average power. Remember that average power refers to some finite duration of time, like 10 minutes or 10 seconds, or maybe just one second. But sometimes we're interested in instantaneous power. So when you see P by itself, we're referring to the power at a single moment in time. In that case, you're going to take the average power and you're going to take its limit as delta T goes to zero. So we think about the work that is done in one second, or maybe one millisecond, or one microsecond, or one nanosecond. In the limit, as delta T becomes infinitesimal, what we have is the instantaneous power. As you might guess, a little bit later, we'll replace this equation here with a derivative, although right now we're not ready for that step. We'll want to measure power, and as such, we'll need a standard of measurement. The SI unit of power is the watt, named in honor of the British physicist James Watt. And as you've probably guessed, one watt, W, is equal to one joule per second. That makes sense because work is measured in joules and time is measured in seconds. So one watt is one joule per second. Don't confuse this W for work with this W for what. In other words, we're using the same exact letter, but you need to pay attention to the context to figure out what it means. Another common unit of power is the horsepower, and one horsepower is approximately equal to 746 watts of power. Horsepower is a common unit in industrial applications and in the automotive industry. If you have an engine or a motor, that has an output of one horsepower, then that engine can output 746 watts of power, or it can perform 746 joules of work every second. If your automobile engine is a 100 horsepower engine, what that means is that that automobile engine can perform 74,600 joules of work every second that it is running. Of course, that work then goes into displacing your automobile, moving it from point A to point B. In our last lecture on the conservation of energy, we found that energy can be transferred from one type to another. More specifically, as forces perform work, through that work, they're transferring energy in or out of a system, 
or transferring it within a system. For example, a conservative force like gravity can transfer energy from kinetic energy to potential energy. In that case, we would say kinetic energy is being converted to potential energy and vice versa. On the other hand, a non-conservative force like friction can transfer energy out of a system altogether. In that case, we would say that kinetic or potential or both are being converted to other types of energy like thermal energy. The important point here is that when forces perform work on a system, they are essentially transferring energy. And so we can identify work with a change in energy. Exactly what kind of energy are we talking about? Is it mechanical energy? Is it potential energy? Is it kinetic? Well, that depends on the precise type of work or force that you're talking about. For now, we don't need to be that precise. For now, we just need to realize that this identification between work and changes in energy gives us a new definition of power. On the previous slide, we defined power as the rate at which work was performed. Now we can define power as the rate of energy transfer. So power, at least instantaneous power, is equal to work divided by time in the limit as this time goes to zero, we're now replacing work with a change in energy. And from your calculus class, you should now remember that delta E over delta T in this particular limit is simply a derivative. So our most general definition of power refers to the derivative of E with respect to time. The power of a system, whether it's a motor or a person, tells us how quickly that system can transfer energy from one type to another. When you look at a light bulb and you see that the light bulb is rated as 20 watts, what that really means is that this light bulb, this system, is capable of transferring or converting 20 joules of energy from electrical energy to light energy. And a generator that is rated as 7,000 watts can transfer or convert 7,000 joules of energy every second, usually from chemical energy provided by the gasoline, for example, to electrical energy if it's generating electricity. If the engine of this car is rated at 140 horsepower, then it's rated at 104,440 watts, which means that every second that this engine is operating, it is capable of converting almost 104,000 joules of energy from chemical energy provided in the gasoline to the kinetic energy of the car as it speeds down the highway. Let's solve a practice problem involving power. A 75 kilogram crate is to be pushed 150 meters across the floor of a warehouse. A person must apply a constant force and complete the job in 50 seconds. If mu sub k is 0.2, what is the average power output required of the person? So notice that in this problem, we're not just saying that the person must push the crate 150 meters, we're now specifying time. We're saying the person must push the crate 150 meters and must do so in 50 seconds. So the rate at which work is performed is now important for us. This problem is going to involve a lot of concepts from previous chapters. So it helps before you start doing a lot of algebra to create a concept map for yourself. A concept map helps you figure out how you're going to navigate your way through the solution of a problem. What we really need is P for power. That's what the question is asking for. You need to recognize that power is related to concepts like work and time. So to figure out the power, we need to figure out W. And we also need to know what delta T is, which is given to us as 50 seconds. Then you also need to remember that work itself is related to concepts like force and distance. In fact, that's what work is. It's force times distance. So if we want to answer this question, we need to figure out what force the person needs to apply to this crate. Notice the force is not specified in the problem. That's probably something we need to figure out. 
And of course, if you want to figure out force, you need to know things like acceleration and mass. After all, Newton's second law of motion relates force and acceleration. So if we're going to figure out the force, we'll have to figure out the acceleration of this crate as it moves 150 meters in 50 seconds. So this is our concept map. We're essentially going to figure out the acceleration, then figure out the force, then figure out the work, and then finally answer the question by figuring out power. To figure out the acceleration, we will need our kinematic equations. So look back at your kinematic equations, go through the list of equations that you had, and quickly you will find that you can calculate the acceleration by multiplying the distance by 2 and dividing by t squared. You know what t is, it's 50 seconds, and the distance that we want to move is 150 meters. When we plug those numbers in, we find that the necessary acceleration is 0.12 meters per second squared. In other words, if you want to successfully complete this job, pushing the crate 150 meters in 50 seconds, you need to push hard enough to achieve this acceleration. Now, what does it mean to push hard enough? Well, you know that the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And we know what the mass of the crate is. It's 75 kilograms. And we know what acceleration is. We just figured that out. So what that means is that we need to have a net force of nine newtons acting on this crate in order for us to get the job done. Now remember that Newton's second law of motion gives you the net force. So that's the total force that is acting on this crate. What are the forces that are acting on this crate? Well, there are at least two forces. There is the force of the person that is trying to get the job done. And of course, there's the force of friction that is opposing the person. So there are at least two forces acting on this crate. To be fair, there's also the normal force, there's also weight, but normal and weight operate in the vertical direction, in the y direction. For now, we're interested in the x direction or in the horizontal direction. So be, to be a little more precise, I need to say that the net force in the x direction must be 9 newtons. Now the net force, of course, is the force of the person minus the force of friction. Remember, friction is pointing opposite to the person, hence the negative sign. Rearranging that equation, we find that the force of the person is F net, which we know to be 9 newtons, and the force of friction. The force of friction in this case is 147 newtons. You should be able to quickly calculate that for yourself. Remember, friction is mu times n, n is mg. Putting all that together, you find that the force of friction is 147 newtons. And finally, we find that the force of the person is 156 newtons. So if we want to get this job done in 50 seconds, the person must apply in the x direction a force of 156 newtons to cause this kind of an acceleration so that the job can be done in this time. Now that we have the force of the person, we can figure out the work of the person. Remember that the work of the person is equal to the force of the person times the distance traveled. Actually, it's a little more complicated than that. In general, to calculate work, you have to do an integral. But in this case, the force is constant and the force points in the same direction as the displacement. So you can use the easier formula force times distance. Of course, we're ultimately interested in power, and power is work divided by delta t. Work, as we were just saying, is force times distance. We're going to divide that by delta t, and we find, finally, that the power is 468 watts. Notice that we're talking about the force of the person, and therefore the work of the person, and therefore we're talking about the power of the person. So this is the power output that is required of the person. This person, in order to get the job done, must do 468 joules of work every second, 450 seconds, to get this job done. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.